first part of our Alex talks was really, really interesting, and uh, and I was never as nervous as uh, today for the Lex talks. So, uh, so Bear and uh, Ruben, thank you for that wonderful demonstration and uh, and showing that it works. So it's really fantastic. And um, and yeah, we have more really cool stuff coming up. And um, my uh, my job is. Uh, basically uh, very limited, and it's just to introduce your MC for this uh, session to you all, which is uh, uh, Lauren Brown. Uh, Lauren Brown is uh, the US Vice Chairman uh, of uh, DLA Piper. Uh, he's the chair of the dispute practice and a member of the global board and the US Executive Committee. Lauren is one of the country's most distinguished uh, litigators uh, in the tech field. He litigates high-profile uh, pharmaceutical and medical device and mass tort and product liability and other uh, civil uh, matters. Um, so uh, as a firm leader, he's uh, overseeing the firm's efforts um, in uh, developing new ways of delivering uh, legal services and uh, delivering the legal expertise uh, to their to their clients. So uh, Lauren will uh, be running the session. So without uh, further ado, please uh, join me in welcoming Lauren Brown. Well, thank you, everyone. I uh, first thing I want to do is just thank Roland and all of his colleagues at Codex for. Um, inviting us to be a part of this program. Our firm is absolutely thrilled to be a part of the program, and we've brought a number of colleagues here um, for this first session. Um, so as, as Roland said, I'm a vice chair of the U.S. firm. Um, for those of you that don't know DLA, we are a global law firm. We're actually got offices in 90, in 90 markets around the world, um, almost 4,500 lawyers. Um, and we operate in almost every major city where we're allowed to do business. Um, and so you might wonder why a global law firm is um, so thrilled about being part of this. I think we come at this from multiple perspectives. Our, our first and foremost, our clients are um, rapidly developing new technologies, and we want to provide the best advice and counsel we possibly can as they're developing these new technologies and do that in a very responsible way and not eat the law while we're doing that. And so that's, that's one perspective. Another perspective is that um, we're trying to develop new technologies ourselves as a law firm um, to enhance the quality and the range of services that we're providing to our clients. So we're looking carefully at a number of uh, technologies and tools that can sit side by side with the lawyers that are that are uh, providing advice and counsel to our clients. And I think some of you heard a little bit about um, some of what we're working on yesterday. And then third, like many of you, um, we want to make an impact in our communities. And we're looking for ways to use technology to make a bigger impact in the pro bono arena and in our communities globally. And we're looking carefully at those opportunities too, and I already have some ideas out of just the first few hours of being part of this. So thanks again, and now you can see why I'm uh, thrilled to introduce the panelists that we have. I'm going to introduce four different uh, presentations today. The first one's going to be uh, called uh, Breaking the Legal Language Barrier, Thoughts on the State of Legal NLP, and that's being presented by uh, Dick Hartung and Daniel Martin Katz. Um, Dick Hartung is the executive director of the Center for Legal Technology and Data Science at Bucharest Law School in Hamburg, Germany, and a non-residential fellow at Codex. And uh, Daniel Martin Katz is an associate professor of law at Illinois Tech, Chicago Kent College, and the director of the Law Lab at Illinois Tech. So let's give them a warm welcome and look forward to... Okay, so uh, natural language, I think it's fair to say, is the coin of the realm here in La La Land. We have a new movie coming to a theater near you. 
<laughs> well, well that, that can be edited in post-production. Yeah. You know, the encoding of this neural net, it starts right over there, and in law schools like it. You know, many of my law students say that the first year of law school is like learning a new language. That's a, that's a quote that they often say. And so in support of this activity, we offer our students a steady diet of casebooks, specialized dictionaries, text-based sum summaries, which is all part of this language diet that, that we put them on. It's a fairly very healthy, healthy diet we have. Uh, uh, so the, the other part, it's not just consumption of language, but it's also construction and interpretation of language. Lawyers, judges, regulators are massive producers of texts. They produce briefs and memos and statutes, opinions, regulations, contracts. All the legal systems of the world are producing this on a very large basis. So when we, we've obviously had a significant growth in legal technology over the past decade, 1,800 companies and counting and the, uh, uh, at techindex.law.stanford.edu. That's a plug rolling, I got that in. Uh, so, you know, if you, look at the, if you look at across the companies and across the offerings, people are trying to use tools and technology to help na people navigate the scale and the complexity of the law, which is quite vast. Many, most, slash most, of these offerings had to make some account for natural language because it's pervasive in law. Because almost every road in law leads to a document, and that document is encoded in natural language. The stubborn persistence of natural language, despite laudable attempts to, to, to move away from natural language and towards code, I think we're unlikely to see natural language displaced as the method of, of encoding the law for the foreseeable future. It's the old talk by my friend and colleague Mike Bomarito 10 years ago, all the different ways the law intersects computation and, and otherwise. So there's good news, though. There's good news, and the good news is that many of you are aware of, but I'm saying this for folks that maybe are new, you know, we have a field of natural language processing that has something to offer our field here in law. And so, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's uh, the intersection of language and computer science put together, sometimes computational linguistics. If you come from the linguist side into, in, if you come from CS, you come in as NLP, and that you can, sometimes it's considered a branch of AI if you're being a little loose on the concepts, that's fine. What's the rough definition of NLP? It's the statistical representation of language. Taking words, turning them into numbers. Machines num understand numbers, so there's a transformation that has to take place. Historically, this is the divide. Syntax-based methods are pretty easy to implement. Semantic methods are hard. They're hard to scale in particular. And so there's this chasm. People, we've made a lot of progress on a lot of problems by kind of using syntax-based methods, um, but what we've seen in the last few years in NLP is a lot of clever ways to get at semantics. Clever ways to get at semantics. Not, not strong semantics like kind of light semantics. This I would consider kind of kicks off the, this kicks off the kind of wave of kind of next gen NLP papers now almost 10 years old. So word, we have Word to Vec, we have Elmo, Burt, um, and, and a series of other papers in, the, in this kind of vein. I mean, this is a short talk, so we won't go into all the details. But I would say they're kind of filling the chasm and, and trying to help people walk across. So if you go back to, the, say, the Word to Vec paper, man is the woman as king is the queen, yeah? That conceptual bridge that's just easy for you to make in your mind is very difficult to actually generalize in, in, a, in a piece of technology. And so that's the, that's, the, that's the dualism that I live. I'll say more about it. It's just where I encode law students with the language of law, and then we look over at a lot of the tools, and they pretty, have a th pretty thin account for legal language. And a lot of lawyers think immediately, well, if you can't know what I know, then it can't make progress. That's also not correct. But it's, there's just, this is where we are today. So that's sort of general NLP, what, or general NLP. What about legal NLP? Well, if you kind of, we're gonna do past, present, and future here today, but you know, historically, there were a fairly limited number of commercial applications if you went back, say, 50 years. I mean, there, there's the Lexus Terminal, Westlaw Terminal from back in, back in the day. Um, Richard gave a talk like 10 years ago at a conference I ran. He said, you know, when I came on the scene in the 1980s, there were less than 40 academic papers on AI and law ever written in the English language, 40 total. Almost no papers on NLP in the law, okay? And so in the 80s, uh, we started to see into the 80s into the 90s in the AI and law conference and Jurex conferences, you know, they, they, got, they got started and they got focused on topics like legal argumentation and legal reasoning. It's a very attractive problem to work. It's a hard problem. It's a darn hard problem. 
uh, to work on. Um, but I would say, and you know, really until the 2010s, the academic sphere and the commercial sphere didn't really collide. And then it collided in a pretty serious way. And around the time Codex was actually being founded, this, this really, there was a big acceleration that took place. Um, but if we kind of look at both the academic and the commercial sphere, when it comes to legal NLP, it's still a pretty thin account, particularly if you compare it to where subject matter experts, lawyers are, in terms of their understanding of legal language, it's, it's not even close. Um, this is not uncommon across the NLP world. I'll just give you this as an example, maybe the closest parallel to our field. I mean, Amazon had to build a special application, a special engine to process medical records because it's not legal, it's not English, it's medical English. It's not English, it's legal English. It's a specialized lexicon and, and you have to deal with it. So that's the scientific and engineering task you know, that we wanna talk about today um, is how are we gonna improve the performance of these NLP models? How are we gonna kind of further go in and have a deeper account for legal language in these methods? Um, and that I think involves grafting the general NLP developments that we've seen over the last decade to the, to the main specific needs here in law. And so to talk about where the, more of the present, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Dirk Hartman. All right, thank you, Dan. Okay, I'll get you started with the present. And here is, I think, the most current large-scale NLP in law survey paper. That paper here, um, Jong et al. 2020, so it's current as of 2020, looks at over 100 papers. So from 40 for the entire field, over 100 for the subfield. There are different application types. Um, this, I would say, is a good starting point if you want to get a feeling for what's going on from a technical perspective. Now we do here have, have work from Mike Bomarito, you saw him on the little, on the little tile for the video, uh, and Dan from 2018, where they took a traditional uh, toolkit, NLTK, very famously developed around here, and applied that to law, made it law specific. So you could use all those wonderful things that you can do with natural language processing, like uh, legal information extraction, embedding classifiers, lexica, and apply all that just with a Python package to law. So we see the development of law-specific tools, um, 2018, not that long ago. And then here we have the latest large data set contribution. This is Jang et al. I mentioned that also because it's, uh, it's an all Stanford production. Um, and they realized two important things. One, um, they say most legal NLP tasks that sometimes get lauded and reported in the papers, they are too easy. They are not re fairly representing what the actual tasks that lawyers do every day required. So we get great scores, but we do not necessarily translate that into the commercial sphere. And the other thing they look at, which is very meaningful, is that they look, well, pre-training, so spe specifically training NLP models with legal data. How much does that help for these models? Because most models, like large-scale transformer models, they're typically not trained with legal data, but with general corpora, okay? So this is, this is a bit of the setup. Now, these aren't the only papers. Again, here are another six data set papers. And all of them report scores for different approaches and models. And you can easily see how it becomes hard to compare one to the other. Enter um, our idea of kind of making, creating a task that would see how well the models generally uh, interact with legal language. Now, we didn't come up with this idea per se. This is uh, what's called GLUE, the General Language Understanding <coughs> Evaluation Benchmark, and then SuperGLUE, which is the second iteration because people were so good at solving the tasks that we actually, they actually created a second one. And the idea is to create a diverse data set that is really very diverse in terms of um, text size, different tasks, different, um, different uh, degrees of difficulty to see how well what each individual company or academic develop, how well that would work on a general basis on other tasks. Um, they have a diagnostic data set that tells you why your model doesn't do so well. And then of course there's a public leaderboard so that you can see that you actually like, beat your colleague from down the hall. So we took that idea, you can check it out at gluebenchmark.com. Uh, I will say that again, there is glue and there is super glue, so another level of difficulty. And they have all that infrastructure in place. You just upload your model, it gets evaluated, you get the scores back. Now we're not quite there yet. Um, we've started with the first iteration that is putting together these data sets. So this is Lex Glue. It was, I'm happy to report, accepted at ACL Main Conference 2022. If you're really into this stuff, um, you can probably spend a whole 45 minutes of presentation at the end of May in Dublin. I mean, there's also other good reasons to come to Dublin, so if you're considering it, there you go. Um, this is, by the way, a collaboration, not of the two of us, but it took actually uh, a bunch of people, seven people, five different countries, three continents, to make that work. Um, you can check out the paper on wsari.us uh, slash lexglue, but I'll give you the main points really quickly. 
we have seven data sets, and I mentioned diversity, right? So we have, we have data from the European Court of Human Rights, from the US Supreme Court, we have EU <coughs> legislative data, we do have contracts in there, and we do have um, data from, like for, I said, SCOTUS, and then also CASEHOLD, it's, it's the paper that is here from Stanford that I mentioned earlier on. The tasks are different, like they are mostly variations of classification tasks, but you can, you can see that those data sets are also quite different in terms of size, like from ranging from like 5,000 to over 60,000. So the, the idea is to be as diverse as possible. Let's see the models, because we have to um, provide, in order to get a competition going, you have to somehow make a first mark. We have seven models here, uh, very classic transformer models, all of them, like BERT, Roberta, DBERTA. Um, and then the last two, legal BERT and what we call case law BERT, um, they are pre-trained with legal data. The other ones are general language models. Uh, now, to add to the confusion, case law BERT is sometimes also called legal BERT, so there's natural language for you. But the idea <laughs> that I wanna, uh, I wanna, wanna present here is that these are different approaches, though all of them are transformers, right? They're like latest generation um, NLP models. And then the interesting question is how, how do they do? Oh, sorry, there we go. So this is a lot of information. Um, we have, of course, performances for every single data set and every single model. Um, the TF-IDF and SVM thing is the baseline, right? This is not state-of-the-art technology. And you can see that some things are easy. Unfair terms of services, a data set where you have to identify whether the terms of services of a set company or clauses violate specific legal rules. We do very good. Most models can pretty much solve them. Like uh, the micro F1 scores of like 0.96, this is nearly solved. While others, you can see that that big bird gets a score on Euralex of 56.8. So th that's, that's not good territory. That's not what you would typically publish in NLP research. So that's why it's so important to look at all these things together, which is what we do here. Here are the overall aggregated scores. You can see that tip, like generally with model size, the performance goes up, but the winners here are the two um, pre-trained models, legal bird and case law bird. Now, it might not look like a big difference, but actually getting, it's, it's about like two to four percentage points uh, improvement is kind of a big deal. You would normally say for commercial purposes from 0 0.8 is where things get interesting. So we're fairly close. Keep in mind that this is for a wide variety of general tasks. Now, most importantly, we want you and everyone you know, your family, your friends at home, to actually build new models and try, try them out. I know some people here in the room are already doing it. Yeah, I'm looking at you. Um, you do, how do you do that? Well, we don't have the whole infrastructure in place, so you, uh, you can deploy that through Hugging Face. That's what this is. Um, you can load it. You just submit it to the GitHub page. There's a whole setup. We will build the infrastructure in the near future, but you have to start somewhere. So I really hope that you make some submissions and that we see your name on the leaderboard. And that would I hand it over to Dan to close us out here. Okay, so now I'd like to go into the future, say a little bit about, more about what we are anticipating for Lex Glue and maybe some other comments about legal NLP to wrap up. Um, so we have this, this will be in the slides that we'll make available in, in, in just a little bit, but I'll just want to highlight a few, few things that we're planning. One, as Dirk mentioned, we're planning to build uh, the prop a proper infrastructure and including a leaderboard because, you know, that's the type of thing that will get more people to participate. We want to extend the benchmark to other languages, to data sets in other languages, and um, to more tasks. So if you have a task that you'd like to submit, uh, um, you know, we sort of established some, some criteria for the tasks. So a lot of the papers that you find out there are not well documented. The code is a mess. The data is hard, impossible to load. So, you know, I mean, these are just some of the criteria coming in. Uh, um, we'll have hopefully a super lax glue like they did after everybody crushes all these tasks. We'll just have to create some more tasks. Uh, um, and then uh, we're interested in creating a kind of large scale pre-trained corpus uh, across um, kind of a, a kind of the swath of law, if you will. Um, and that kind of leads me into this final point, which is the future for legal NLP. Again, I, I live this dualism, like I told you at the beginning, between training my students' neural network through, through, through courses and then working with these neural networks uh, um, through, the, through the paper that you saw here. Um, I just want to take you back to this. So let's just make sure we understand what the problem is or how this is structured. We hand people a bunch of Wikipedia articles and then have them work on legal tasks. Now, we don't structure the regular world like that. Why, I mean, it's, it's almost surprising that the information that they're provided can do as well as they can. I'll even take you down to this. I feed it, you know, a millions of US court cases and then have it identify, you know, a problem in a contract. I mean, why would that, 
that's not how we structure the industrial, industrially structure the profession. So it's not logical to think that that's going to be the basis to have great, great performance. It's sort of just a quick and, quick and easy thing to do. I'll give it a bunch of cases, and they'll magically know everything about contracts. So I think the question for the future of the field is, what is the diet of information from a free training perspective that, that, um, that these transformers need to go on? And it isn't going to be a diet of Wikipedia articles alone. I mean, it's going to be some mixture, I think, of general language combined with legal language, maybe even domains, like even task-specific language, though. So, and that, that triad of those three things, and what's the combination of those? That's really op an open question at this point. But that's kind of where, you know, hopefully by creating this infrastructure, we can cut people to the front of the line of actually answering that question, because that's the thing that's interesting from a scientific and an engineering uh, perspective. And so we're interested in sort of what approach performs best across all tasks, and of course, on a per task basis, because you know, we're not necessarily interested in uh, 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 one, one ring to rule them all. Um, so that's it. That's us, uh, uh, Dan and Dirk, uh, Bucerius Law School, Chicago Camp. Thank you. Um, so, I'm sorry, just super basic question about, about the, the benchmarking. When you're looking at, say, unfair terms, I just want, the ground truth for that is a bunch of lawyers came to, what, what is the ground truth for whether the document has unfair terms or not? Is that a bunch of lawyers? You know this data set yeah, better than yeah. I do. Um, well, first of all, and with all of these, I, I think we should point to the original papers that created the data sets, because too, all too often people look at these benchmarks and then think that was the hard work. It was hard work, believe me, but the individual papers are ex like excellently written and really good, so there's a lot of explanation in there. But I believe that, if, if I remember correctly, the TOS uh, data set has um, yeah, expert or subject matter expertise okay. At, okay. at the heart of it. Also, hi, Dirk. I said hi to Dan, yeah, I didn't say exactly. hi to you. <laughs> Okay, we'll see you. We'll see you online. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, Stephen Keynes is going to do our next presentation called "Expanding the Civic Technology Horizon: Lessons Learned from Leading Tech Policy in America's Tenth Largest City." Uh, Stephen currently serves as the Deputy Chief Innovation Officer for the City of San Jose and Senior Advisor to Mayor uh, Sam Licardo. I met Stephen last night, and I'm very much looking forward to this presentation. Awesome. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lauren. I really appreciate it. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Future Law 2022. I've just enjoyed all of the presentations and the conversations. Special thank you goes out to Roland, Mike, Susan, and Megan for organizing this entire thing. And thank you to the Stanford event staff that keeps this thing, whole thing running. Uh, my name is Stephen Keynes. I'm the Deputy Chief Innovation Officer of the City of San Jose. And my real goal for this presentation is just to give you all a little taste as to how do cities use technology to benefit their residents. And so I'll first start with just a little bit about me, just to provide some context as to how I got to this role. Although this is my first formal role in government, I feel like I've been like a public servant my entire life. Uh, in law school, I did juvenile delinquency defense for children charged with crimes in Miami-Dade. Um, I also worked with the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative, combating cyber sexual harassment, both from a legislative but also technological means, and also community outreach. And I also worked with the Legal Services of Greater Miami, just essentially putting technology processes in the way to maximize benefit uh, but I'm a legal technologist, a policymaker, an academic, and attorney. My policy areas for the city include intergovernmental relations. I helped establish their privacy program. I helped fast the first uh, citywide privacy policy in the state of California. Uh, I work on public safety issues, uh, digital inclusion. I also help uh, focus on STEM education to make sure that everybody has a competitive chance. Um, I also helped contribute ideas to the Day One project, uh, specifically around how the federal government should regulate surveillance AI. And then I'm excited to announce I have a chapter coming up in the Oxford Handbook on AI Governance, also on surveillance AI. 
So I'll um, go now into a little bit about San Jose. I know a lot of people traveled a long ways here, so I'll give you a little bit of information about us. So we are the 10th largest city in the US with a little bit over 1 million population, and we are located in the heart of Silicon Valley. And so I'd like to say that San Jose is kind of a modern invention. This is 1914. As you can see, it's all farmland, as were all the surrounding areas in places like Cupertino and the other places in Santa Clara. In 1940, coming to, around to the close of the Second World War, you're seeing a little bit more build up in uh, buildings. And then now, 1950s, you're getting a little bit closer to what you see in downtown San Jose today. But with all this rapid growth, often come certain challenges and problems. And that's kind of what we grapple with every day, these, this exponential growth. And how do you actually uh, handle this? And you know, we originally build as the LA of the North. And you know, for all the, uh, you know, the problems that come with that in terms of having a car-based city that's so scattered. Uh, but what is San Jose really about? When I think about San Jose, the first thing I think about is diversity. We are a population where 60% of the residents speak a language other than English at home. So that's the language that's spoken around the dinner table. We have the largest overseas Vietnamese com community. We have a rich legacy of workers' rights with uh, Cesar Chavez. Uh, we're also the innovation economy. I know a lot of people like to tell the narrative that California has lost all tech, but I can assure you that that is not true. And we are still the HQ of PayPal, Zoom, eBay, Adobe, Cisco, and other really great companies. We're widely recognized for being the number five best city for talent. We have some of the best transit access in Silicon Valley. And year over year, we're, rewarded, we're awarded uh, innovation awards just for our work. And I'll get into the digital inclusion, some of the privacy work a little bit later. But what does city government do? Where does all that tax money go? Uh, you know, I won't read everything out on this slide, but I think that this is just a good introduction into some of the works of the various uh, departments within the city. And I'd just like to point out that as a city, uh, we are very uh, lean as an organization. Only 7,000 people work for the city of San Jose and manage it for a million. So I work with a lot of very talented, overworked at times, but very talented people that are, work really hard to make sure that things kind of stay on. But, you know, we really do accomplish a lot as a city. And, you know, even in a place with so much opportunity, unfortunately, there's still this inequality that we see. And it's very unfortunate that people that grow up in the, back, in the backyard of Google sometimes feel as if that opportunity might as well be another continent away. So in order to address this, the Mayor's Office of Tech Innovation, uh, we leverage technology uh, to an uh, in ingenuity to improve the San Jose livelihoods, access opportunities, and our city experience. So we really exist to try to close that gap and make sure that everybody can kind of reap the benefits that this whole technological innovation has really changed uh, the Bay Area and specifically the city of San Jose. So what areas do we really work on? You know, if I wanted to make three big buckets, I would say digital inclusion and opportunity. You know, we have a goal to connect all, uh, to connect 99% of San Joseans to meaningful internet service by the end of the year. Uh, we work on public safety and privacy, as I mentioned before. And I'd just like to also specify, we're also focusing on public safety integrity. So, you know, not only are you getting the services, but how can you ensure that those public safety services are, you know, just equitable and correct in that sense. And then finally, we're looking forward to the next generation of transportation. We've done a number of really exciting pilots and uh, we're really spinning up some stuff this summer specifically around transportation too as well. Uh, but for this presentation, I'll just give you three quick use cases and I'll share some lessons learned with them. Uh, the first is digital inclusion. And so when we talk about digital inclusion, I think it means something different to everyone else. So I'll provide you with a brief definition. But you know, just use the uh, traditional three-legged stool method, if you will. It's do you have a device that works, something that can you know, handle modern software? Uh, do you have an access point that's reliable with the quality internet speeds to ensure that you and your family can give what you need? Um, and that's essentially, and the co that's essentially the core. Of oh, sorry, and the finally, digital literacy. Rather, um, do you have the knowledge to safely navigate the internet and essentially accomplish whatever it is that you seek to get? And so here are six of some of our digital inclusion initiatives. I'll first start off by saying the San Jose Public Library is amazing. They are really the connection point to a lot of our residents, and they host a lot of our services. So for things like community Wi-Fi, we've been able to distribute 16,000 hotspots, um, and we've connected 300,000 residents, uh, hopefully by the end of the year. Um, a lot of this work is based off of our digital inclusion fund, which started in 2015, which is a $24 million fund meant to address this. We largely use community grants, so we work with a lot of nonprofits specifically in the area to ensure that we are adequately meeting our residents' needs. Uh, we've tried to essentially utilize Web3 and uh, crypto also. Uh, we have this pilot running right now with Helium specifically where San Jose residents can host mining spots within their home. It uses one megabit of internet on a proof of state network. That Those funds go to a wallet that can be used to purchase either internet 
internet service or devices. And so what's really great about this is this is San Jose residents helping each other um, in a sense. And then also we're you know utilizing federal and state initiatives like the uh, broadband equity access and deployment funding, which is a historic amount of funding uh, just to essentially expand broadband throughout the US. So we're thinking critically about how do we use this in the most efficient manner. Um, moving next, we have device refurbishment. Sustainability is a major goal for the city of San Jose. We're hoping to be carbon neutral by 2030. And in order to aid that goal, we also uh, really push device refurbishment. So people will turn in old devices and we'll buy things like Chromebooks for uh, children in need specifically. And then finally, I touched on the digital literacy angles that uh, our library does a great job at. But what can you really learn from digital inclusion? Uh, the first is that it's a spectrum that I think has a constantly evolving definition. And so it's no longer sufficient to just say, are you connected, yes or no? You know, like you need to return to that three-legged school and evaluate each of those kind of parameters to ensure that it's sufficient. And I think too, you know, over time, you should really start to evolve what does connectivity mean in your kind of community and see if you can advance that and make that more bold and more prominent in a sense. The second is that community partnerships are crucial. You could just put up a sign outside your house that says free Wi-Fi, but until you can connect to the people that actually need it to that, it's kind of useless. So you know, you really need to be able to work with within your own community organizations and how we rely on them to kind of uh, continue the pipeline of bringing people into the door. And then three, just constant iterations of strategic planning are required. As anyone in government can tell you, anything can happen. So whether it was the declining revenue from small cell 5G deployment or the FAA deciding to do buffer zones around airports, that's caused us to redesign and reiterate. And so often when I talk to people at broadband, I say, just try to plan the next year or two and you know, just know that that might have to change. So next, we're moving to traffic safety. Um, unfortunately, traffic safety is something that's become very prominent in the U.S. Um, in San Jose alone, we're already at almost triple the traffic fatalities that we've had last year at this exact point. So this is something extremely critical that we're trying to address. Um, and, you know, I think when I started this work, I thought that the whole notion of Vision Zero, I thought it was a little bit... Uh, you know, in the ether, and, you know, and a little bit too hopeful that, you know, we could live in a world without traffic accidents. But until you actually try to move in that direction, I don't think any meaningful steps will be made. If you just assume that traffic fatalities are just going to be a given, then I don't think anything really changes. So how do we address uh, traffic safety? So first, we have a LiDAR near miss pilot, because it's not just about the collisions that happens, it's also about the ones that almost do. And you can learn a lot of data from almost accidental collisions. We're also looking at something called the Safest Driver Program, which has been piloted in, in cities like Boston and Seattle, which actually give financial incentives um, to citizens who voluntarily download an app for a limited period of time, which would measure your driving ability, assign quantitative scores to give you suggestions on how to improve, and you can win money on like most improved driver, best driver, and other kind of superlatives, if you will. And so they've seen marketed improvements in the ability to drive and also just the fact that people know why they are a bad driver in that sense. Uh, three, if you've ever used Waze and you've speeded, when it says kind of heads up, you're speeding, if you can expand those, that type of heads up awareness to other apps like Google Maps, that's another way that you might be able to at least do a more, some more behavioral nudges in that sense. Um, four, traffic partnerships, so just working with other Bay Area cities to make sure we have a very consistent approach to make sure everything's in line. We know a lot of people commute from city to city, so we want to make sure you have a, cons like a very consistent experience as you do this. Uh, five, just quick build, that is your traditional things like bike lanes, bollards, and just city infrastructure. Um, so that's uh, another major component that our DOT is specifically using. And then finally, automated license plate readers, which admittedly is something that I'm not a huge fan of, but unfortunately there are certain intersections where there have been numerous hit and runs, and so to increase accountability, we began using ALPRs to you know, essentially have more detection for things like that. So what can you really learn about traffic safety? Uh, the first is that there's a certain unpredictability to it that has been constantly amazing me. As a city, we've identified 17 corridors or streets, which a lot of our collisions happen on. However, specific uh, intersections can often be hard to predict. So we found that sometimes you'll invest thousands of dollars into an intersection only to have another problem one you know, a few six months later. So staying malleable, not being too married to the idea of having fixed solutions has been one thing that I've learned in this process. The second is that behavioral nudges may be more impactful than purely punitive action. I was really encouraged by the safest driver pilot specifically, and I don't think that's you know, necessarily always putting more officers on the road and more tickets is going to necessarily get the job done. And then third, just regional cooperation is key. We've learned so much, the more that we open up with SF and Oakland, so I'm really great and grateful that we've been able to establish this partnership and just continue talking with them. Uh, now moving to our final kind of use case, digital services and equity. One thing I'm really proud about the city of San Jose is that we're not just policy based, we also build things in house. So I'm really happy to share some of this with you all today. Uh, so 1SJ was a great product built by one of my uh, colleagues, which aggregates mental health resources for youth and young adults. Uh, last summer, I supervised five students, three of which came from Codex, which was great, to build a police transparency portal app that correlates with SB 1421. 
Uh, three, I've mentioned the citywide privacy program and how we've just kind of continuously been able to kind of build up that program and we've, our office has really assisted in that. Uh, third, Silicon Valley Strong was established to help distribute resources during the pandemic, and we've been able to distribute over 150 meals uh, specifically. And then SJ311 is our, essentially your digital front door to City Hall. It was originally created to essentially uh, reduce the demand on 911. So whether you have like an abandoned car, things like that that are just non-emergency needs, you can use that to connect with your city. And finally, uh, data equity. We had a recent million dollar grant from the Knight Foundation uh, for change management to help it build capacity for data work and advance equity. And so my colleague, Christine Kung, has done a great job at kind of finding different areas for impact and areas of intervention specifically within the city of San Jose. And so just final set of lessons uh, learned. One, uh, accessible services uh, for a diverse population requires a diverse team. So by that, I mean it's not enough to just take some Google API, dump it, and translate the language. You need to have people on your team specifically from those communities that can help you reach them in a very authentic and genuine manner. Uh, two, sustaining and spinning out a project can often be the most difficult in a resource-constrained environment. We often find the building is not that difficult, but figuring out who's going to own it, who's going to maintain it, and things like that is really the crucial part. And so kind of future-proofing thing has really been a focus for our organization. And then three, government is increasingly becoming more familiar with agile design for internal projects, which I think is amazing. The fact that we as a government who are typically viewed as you know, a very slow, sluggish kind of organization can you really utilize a lot of this agile design to quickly iterate and build something very important. So that was my final slide, but I just want to thank all of you for being here today and uh, learning a little bit more about the city of San Jose. Thank you so much, sir. Um, I really enjoy your presentation, especially um, since I wear a regulator's hat back home as well. Um, I think one word, two questions if I may, but one word that stood out to me during your presentation was partnerships. And I think in conferences like these, um, regulators often get pilloried, rightly or wrongly, um, that we don't understand the technology. Um, how do you ensure that you're able to keep up with the technology to hold those key multi-stakeholder conversations that need to happen? I think that's my, my first question. Um, the second question being, as a regulator, you are in charge of a, a, a huge place, right? And you need to take note of a huge range of innovations, as well as huge swaths of risk. How do you ensure that balance? How do you strike that balance, especially as technology keeps developing going forward? Thank you. Yeah, great question, thank you. So on the first, uh, specifically regarding uh, how do we just stay abreast of new technological changes? I think the first is always just having fresh talent coming in and having a revolving door of talent, whether that be from student internships or people coming on. And so one thing I really appreciate about Modi specifically is that even though we've only existed for about six years, um, each of the CIOs has really tried to make sure that we have a diverse team of stakeholders, not just in terms of identity, but then also in terms of expertise. So one reason why I was sought out was because of my privacy expertise and the city knew they wanted to head into that direction. So I think that's one key thing, just kind of having that talent in the room and in-house is definitely very valuable. But also just constantly going out to conferences like this and just being able to meet people. And I think that just having connections to a university like Codex has always just kind of given me that panel of people and that Rolodex to flip through specifically. Um, finally, on your second question, though, regarding risk, that's something that we grapple with every day. Uh, with that Helium project in Web3, there's obviously notable risks, but you know you kind of have to cap the risk at a certain point and think about what are your breakpoints, what are your points where you're going to liquidate and just go home. So I think that at the outset of the project, if you decide what are you willing to risk, that kind of helps guide your decision a little bit rather than kind of entering blind into certain things at certain times, but yeah, that's how we kind of address those issues. Hey, Stephen. I think you've done an amazing job kind of spearheading the uh, technology-driven innovation in San Jose. I'm wondering if this is your probably an exception to the rule when it comes to cities. I'm just wondering how you can evangelize this across all other cities, and what efforts are there being made in other cities across the U.S. to do some of these amazing efforts that you're displaying in San Jose. Thank you so much, Jay. I appreciate that. Um, I would say that one of the good things I think about being recognized by some of the work that San Jose has done is that constantly we're getting hit up by just different cities. So we spoke to Pittsburgh two weeks ago kind of about crypto. Um, Providence, Rhode Island reached out recently. We talked to some other cities regionally as well just about broadband equity. So I think oftentimes people find us in that sense. And so it's, that's kind of one easy way that we can kind of get our message out there. And then two, just from the pure amount of students that we have each summer, last summer we had I think around 35 students managed by like four people, which was a lot. Um, but 
each of those students goes back to their home institution with that experience at San Jose that we, you know, hope is positive in a sense, and they, they kind of become those evangelists, so to speak. So it's always touching to see students come back after two, three years in a new role, and then they share how, like, you know, that one summer was able to kind of help jumpstart them, or at least give them a certain perspective that they lacked before. So I think just kind of actively going out and being that representative in the community, publishing your work, sharing your stories, also your pitfalls, not just the wins, I think is one way that you can really kind of get your message out there. I have one quick question. The, uh, tr the tripling of traffic accidents seem to be a remarkable statistic to me. What, what do you attribute that to? Yeah, that's a great question. There are a lot of theories to it. Um, but the one, one, the one main one that's prevalent is that a lot of people feel that dangerous driving behaviors became a lot more prevalent during the pandemic as there were less people on the roads. But the people that were on the roads were, in many cases, you know, young, male, potentially a little bit more aggressive from being kind of cooped up in that sense. And so a lot of people feel that bad driving behaviors proliferated during the pandemic. People were driving underneath the influence as well. And a lot of those behaviors are now carrying over to still present day as we're starting to just like readjust to traffic. So people are still driving as if the streets are empty. And that's one specific theory as to why this is happening to that level. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Stephen, uh, you do amazing work. I got to know you through Codex. But can you talk about your experience coming into a large uh, organization, and we're used to talking about these in private sector, but in government, it's not just how you talk to other governments, but it's also how within government you talk to the other departments. And you're talking about bringing in new technologies, you're associated with a mayor who's as good as he's doing, he will be termed out, and then there'll be another mayor and another administration. How do you look at change and incorporation of new technology and new ideas within the large organization? Because it's certainly one of the big challenges I imagine you're, you grapple with every day. That's definitely true. As a polit and thank you for the question. But you're right. As a political office, you know things have a shelf life. And so I think the challenge is to build things that are so good or so undeniable that they have to stay. And so I think that the impact of the Digital Inclusion Fund, no one can dispute that that's connected thousands of people that may have not been done so. So I'd argue that whoever the next mayor is, I don't want to say that it would be foolish to remove that, but it might be in that sense, right? So I think that if you can build things that are a little bit apolitical, kind of have wins for everybody around the table, are stable, have, are able to be sustained, and you kind of put them in the right hands before you leave office, that's how you build kind of evergreen progress that is not kind of swept away immediately at the, ne the next election. But great. Thank you so much, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Peter Gunst and Mary O'Carroll are gonna lead our next presentation entitled Legal Operations and the Future of Legal Work. Uh, Peter is an entrepreneurial fellow at Codex um, and the CEO of uh, Legal.io, a marketplace for legal talent used by companies to hire attorneys and legal operations professionals. I just learned yesterday that uh, Peter's also a former colleague of mine at DLA Piper. Um, Mary O'Carroll is uh, the Chief Community Officer at Ironclad, the number one contract lifecycle management platform for innovative companies. Come on up, Peter and Mary. Hey, everyone. I'm Peter. Um, very happy to be here on the 10th edition of Future Law. When we were uh, preparing the agenda, we realized that one of the topics that hasn't been extensively covered in the history of this conference is legal operations. And we really wanted to make sure this got on the agenda because it's a field that is massively gaining in importance and is actually changing the face of who is provisioning legal services and how they are being provisioned. So this seemed like an ideal context for a Lex talk. And no one better to do this talk with, as you'll hear soon, as with Mary O'Carroll. Uh, so I will just set a bit of the scene of why this field is emerging uh, in a way that I hope is entertaining for this time of the day, now that you are at peak attention. But one of the things about the legal market is that it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we deal with a society that is getting more complex. And if you read studies, you'll see you know, large numbers. Um, one commonly quoted number for about this time is that the total legal services market is about $760 billion. And these are all big numbers. I always find them very hard to contextualize, so I want to help you do that. Um, pet food. 
$75 billion market, right? Uh, also a good excuse to include a cat on my slide. Um, but way, way smaller than the legal services market. iPhones, $138 billion market. Not bad for a bunch of phones, right? But way smaller than legal. The airline industry, over $680 billion, lost a couple of billion in the last year, as you can imagine. Um, but way smaller than our legal industry market, which in, the, in itself, this market is about half the size of tourism, uh, which also took a good hit, right? And about a quarter the size of the commercial real estate industry. And it's growing and growing, and the expectation is that within a decade or so, we're looking at a trillion dollar market. And what this means is the society is getting more complex. Now, a big stakeholder uh, in this story is corporate legal. Right? They are one of the massive spenders in legal. They are also one of the entities that feeds law firms. Uh, and in the US, corporations spend over $160 billion on their in-house legal department to give you right, uh, a sense of the scale. That's a third of the market for legal services. And in a world where society is becoming more complex, corporations are spending more money, and they're starting to face cost pressure. Right? They must reduce legal spend. And one way they do that is through the use of technology, which is something right, where we've seen enormous evolutions in the last decade. Um, and these slides are part of the conference materials, but it's essentially a whole bunch of verticals all supporting different aspects of the legal departments right, and delivering services more efficiently. And these t three trends, a growing legal market in a complex world, cost pressure on legal departments that have to deal with this, and the rise of technology make for this perfect storm that has come together for quite a while now, but really accelerating today in the world of legal operations. Thank you, Peter. I don't do podiums. Um, so I'm not a lawyer, and you're probably wondering what the hell are you doing on this stage? And I'm often asked why I'm so obsessed with legal innovation. And it's because I first got my view into why the legal industry is so backwards when I joined a law firm, and I found out about the billable hour. <laughs> and then I found out that we raised rates on our clients every year on January 1st for no good reason. And I literally turned to our leadership team and I said, how are we getting away with this? So fast forward a few years, uh, I was hired at Google as their first legal operations uh, professional. And my GC sat me down my first week there, and he said, how, do we know if we're getting good value out of the money we're spending with outside counsel? Or if we're not tracking hours, do we know if our in-house counsel are actually being productive? And when and when should we be adding headcount? And by the way, what about technology? When should we be using technology? And with each of these questions, I looked at him and I went, I have no idea. And that kind of began my journey into being obsessed with answering these questions and kind of trying to make some improvements about the legal industry. So if you look at the modern corporation right now, function after function, every single part of the company has been completely transformed from the inside out by technology, by data, by process improvement, and just by the need to operate at an unprecedented scale and speed, right? Now legal, of course, has been the last holdout until now. Now for the first time, and I'm sure you're all feeling this, we're feeling real pressure, real disruption in the space, and we're finally seeing that real change happening. And so why we're all here today is because we know that the changes happening now are gonna affect us and our roles, and certainly have even a bigger effect on what legal looks like in the future. Next slide. It's always been my opinion that the in-house legal corporate departments have been the biggest driver of change. And that's because if you think about the general counsel's role, that has changed tremendously over the last few years. So GCs, they used to be in charge of fighting fires, keeping people out of jail, right? being the smartest lawyer in the room. But the GC of today, they have to answer a whole different set of questions. They've got to staff up completely differently, and they have all these new functions that are far different from traditional GC decision making. And so the GC of today has responsibilities like strategic planning and budgeting and professional development and managing this whole team, technology, data analytics, and they're looking around and going, wait a minute, I didn't get any of that training in law school. 
I didn't get any of that training at a law firm. And some of them, frankly, aren't that interested in that part of the job, right? But they know it's really important. So what happened? Next came the rise of the legal operations professional. GC started hiring business professionals to have a seat at the table, to be part of the leadership team, and to really run the rest of the legal department. And when I started, uh, so I started at Google in 2008. We didn't really have job descriptions. We didn't have playbooks about what that meant. So we just kind of went around, found problems, and tried to solve them. And that's kind of a lonely existence. So a few of us <laughs> found each other in Silicon Valley. We started getting together, asking each other questions, sharing ideas, sharing best practices. And that was the birth of what is now known as a group called CLOC, the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. At the time, we were all from big companies, departments of over 100 people. And over time, that group, we grew and grew. We kept meeting until we were so big, we didn't fit into a conference room anymore. And in 2016, we formally incorporated and became an organization uh, known as CLOCK. And when CLOCK came upon the scene in 2016, it had a huge impact in accelerating the pace of change in the industry because for the first time, you now had all these big companies coming together with their collective voice. Now, since then, legal operations has exploded. I think there's something like 3,500 CLOCK members around the world in every country, in every industry, in companies of every single size. We're often seeing it as the first hire after the GC in startups. And it's not just grown in its prevalence, it's grown in its stature. We're seeing legal ops at VP levels, senior vice president levels, and very commonly director levels. And then the scope of the role has also continued to grow and grow over year. So what's all this meant? What happens when you have all these corporations, all these legal departments now focused on efficiency and effectiveness? Well, you create an entire market. You create demand for legal technology. Oh, sorry, I forgot to talk about Google for one second. OK, so with, uh, let me give you a quick insight into what my team looked like at Google, just to practically say, what do these folks do day in and day out? So I had the privilege of growing the team at Google to 60 people in the legal ops team, servicing a department of 1,400 by the time I left. So probably one of the biggest and more mature legal ops functions out there. Our team operated in five major areas. The first, vendor management. So that's outside counsel, financial management, e-billing, RFPs, engagements, et cetera. We then expanded into tech enablement. So all the systems and tools. We did the business requirements gathering, build versus buy analysis, uh, provisioning tools, administering them, implementing them, et cetera. Uh, we had a team that did knowledge management. This was all the professional development and training, but they also um, documented all the processes and policies about how to get stuff done within your legal department. And then really importantly, they created all of our self-service tools for our internal clients so that they could get answers to their questions with, without even needing to come to legal. Our program management team uh, was set up to work on high-level strategic projects. So this is where we partnered really closely with our leadership team, understood what the OKRs were for the company. Uh, we did like regulatory preparedness, like really big cross-functional meaty projects. And then finally, last but not least, data analytics. So this is data provisioning, metrics, dashboarding, analytics, and really allowing our department to be able to be run uh, and have our, all the questions about how to run the department answered with real data rather than having a hunch. So now what's all that done? So with all these companies doing this, we've created this market, this demand for legal technology, right? And we've seen an explosion in investment and uh, just startups in the legal tech world, certainly over the last three to five years for sure. And we've started to think about, OK, how do we disaggregate some of the work? How can we focus on what I call right sourcing? And that's looking across all the work that's coming into the legal department and saying, if I split this up, how do I match each piece of work with the right resource at the right value? Should it go to outside counsel? Should it go to in-house counsel? Does it even need to be done by a lawyer? Can it be onshored, offshore? Where can we use alternative service providers or law companies? And where should we be leveraging automation and technology? So that's become a big question. With all this disaggregation and bringing more parties into the mix, of course, you're going to need an increased uh, need to collaborate across the teams. And then 
of course, data, right? We need more data, we're collecting more data, both externally and as a legal department. We wanna be able to collect that, sift through it, and analyze it as quickly as possible. So that's a skill you need in your department, and interestingly, that's actually become a competitive advantage for legal departments as well. And finally, with all this stuff happening, you're gonna need a different skill set and a bunch of different roles in your legal department and in the legal ecosystem to be able to support all these changes. So back to Peter for a little bit on that. Yeah, I think this is one of the most exciting things about the field of legal operations, and it's very much aligned also with the mission of Codex, right? Serving a variety of different stakeholders in the system. Like this is uh, some data about what this market looks like today and you can kind of see how, how the nature and the constitution of a legal department here is starting to shift. Now, this is data from CLOCK, which Mary mentioned, is, uh, uh, they have wonderful resources that are all freely available. I really recommend you spend some Saturday afternoon reading it. It's exciting stuff. But you know, a large company, which they define as 10 billion and up in revenues, right, an average number of attorneys of 144, but they now have an average of 13 legal operations professionals. And what's happening in the market today is that you know, these legal operations hires are being made sooner in the process in smaller and smaller companies, right? So and this kind of this role, you don't have to be General Electric anymore to need a bunch of data scientists that are thinking about this. And these numbers here, that's actually just the legal operations professionals that are being hired full time by these organizations. But of course, we're living in a time where all our work models are shifting. This is certainly not a service that a typical law firm can provide. So where does the corporation go, right? And you're also seeing the emergence of new players that are able to bring that talent through a variety of models to the customers that need it. Um, and it's a very fast moving and exciting space with many people actually entering it and trying to build these first legal operations functions sooner and sooner. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So as we sort of close, wanted to leave you with three sort of thoughts to keep in mind as we all continue this innovation journey together. First, what is innovation after all? Is it technology? I don't think so. I think the real focus for us as an industry is changing our industry's mindset from one that's really tradition-based into one that's innovation-based, one where we're challenging the status quo, asking how we can do things differently uh, and, and turning the lens on the way things have been done in the past and just looking at them in a different way and trying to do them in a different way. Second, think big, start small. Look, change is hard, and this industry in particular has a lot of unique barriers to change. So we are not gonna come up with new models overnight. It's gonna take time, but we have to start somewhere. So start small, launch and iterate, as we used to say at Google, and just get started. And then finally, really importantly, lean on your community. Uh, we don't need to go on this alone. We're all in this together. So every part of the legal ecosystem, whether you're law school, law firm, a tech provider, an alternative service provider, the more that we're talking to each other and working together, I think we can come out with better outcomes for all the parties involved. And so just encouragement to give, to share, to collaborate, and to be transparent, because I guarantee you, the more that you give and share with the community, the more that you're going to get back. So with that, Peter and I, thank you. I have one if nobody else. Questions? As a recovering uh, wild gotcha lawyer, I salute you. Um, <laughs> but it brings me to my point. How does interoperability figure into clock and these efforts, such as, you know, you constantly have um, large corporations doing m and to expand, and wouldn't they want some interoperability in contract review or in whatever due diligence process they're engaged in? By the same token, you have, um, you know, SPAC or, God forbid, or um, IPO efforts to, to uh, grow companies, wouldn't you want some interoperability of legal talent, you know, the practice of law, internal to the target companies, the portfolio companies? How do you see, if you look four years, five years out, clock 
helping with these processes to use interoperability in contract expression and due diligence. So I think one of the challenges that our industry faces is the fact that everyone's operating in a silo, right? Every legal operations professional that's hired is doing it for the first time in a new place. And we don't have best practices. We don't have standards. That's the, you know, the key word to interoperability. And because of that, I think the tech can't keep up, right? Because you can't innovate and have something that works for five companies when five companies are all doing it a different way. And so that's why I think the community is so important, why groups like Clock are so important, and why I keep saying we've got to collaborate, we have to share, because the more we are able to learn from each other and try to do things a new way, but kind of the same way, then we can get on the same page and start to accelerate things. If I have to wait for all the companies to get up to you know, where, let's say, Google was as a department, that will take years and years and years. So why don't I just hand everyone my playbook, my standards, here's how we're doing it, and bring everyone up faster. There's I don't know. one over there. Mics. Yeah. <laughs> I have a loud one. Okay. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So just to repeat the question, you know, how do we change the mindset of this industry? And I think that is the biggest and hardest part, right? The change that we're expecting is not about technology. It's not about process. It's about the people. And it is entrenched in the way that we teach at law schools. It's entrenched in the way that we teach uh, associates at law firms, the incentive model of law firms. Everything is very individualistic. We pit lawyers against each other. Um, and that's very different from like a business school model where it's all about collaboration and knowledge sharing. So that is, I think, you know, part of the problem. And it, there's, that's why I keep saying it's an entire ecosystem problem. And we've got to just get out there and keep talking. I will you know, lecture at any law school class that will have me or in front of any group that will have me because I think this is exactly right. There's a lot of untraining that we need to do across the entire industry about flipping that mindset. So I, I have one question. Uh, I'd like your thoughts on the current marketplace because from a, a big law perspective, I believed in everything that you were saying up until around the pandemic. I saw the growth of legal operations. I believed that the billable hour was eventually dead. <laughs> and then the pandemic hits and the industry starts seeing the biggest profits and biggest growth it's ever seen. And bill, um, hourly increases, billable hourly increases are higher than they've ever been. The demand for legal services is higher than it's ever been. And it feels like a lot of this is just getting thrown out the window. My colleagues that do corporate transactions can't get enough people to staff their deals and they're pushing through rate increases like, you know, without question. I think the public company clients are different. They're deeply concerned about rising wages and rising hourly rates, where does that all lead? I think that the pie is getting just bigger. Like, I don't think that there's going to be a contraction of the law firm market. We'll see a lot of mergers happening, and we spoke a bit about that yesterday as well. But I think that, um, you know, I fully expect this climate to continue. That's also kind of what all the reports say. And just to see more and more of this technology and then the people that can manage it, like, support the firm. I think we, we hit on this idea of how do you actually convince attorneys, right? I think that's the really hard thing. We know what it's like to be in a firm and to have to hit your hours and serve your clients and actually think about how does this fit into my life. But that's becoming more and more important. But I, I see in the trend that we saw now an acceleration of legal operations. We run a marketplace that finds these individuals. We saw 4x the demand in the last 18 months. And so I think it's just the, both of these things are lifting each other up in a world that is not going to see less legal services. It's only going to see more. Thanks. Can we get some mics? I see there. I don't there. know. Yeah. yeah. I don't want to take uh, too much. Do we need time. One, more one more. Yeah. Okay. and 
and and we're happy to have you for certain. How do you deal with the the legal department or legal operations department? Oftentimes, is seen as the cost a cost center. How do you kind of change that uh, that concept? Uh, in the, and then and then just because I have to, Peter, I love you. Glad you're glad to see your presentation. But please, Mary. Yeah, so this is actually uh, the topic of one of the talks that I'm going to give at CLOCK, which is about how do you up-level the legal department and what's legal ops's responsibility in that, in turning it from a cost center to a value center or a strategic asset to the company. Uh, that's kind of a longer talk, but I would say the short answer is honestly data. And if legal can leverage data, we have more data in our contracts than any other part of the entire organization, and that is so critical, right? It's the source of truth for all the business transactions that take place from revenue to actually executing on the business through the operations and procurement and HR. So if we can, this is why I'm so excited to be at a contracts company, I really believe that the future of legal is gonna be uh, a powerhouse of data, and when you're able to bring really interesting metrics and data to the leadership table, whether it's finance or sales, you have a seat at the table and they want you there and you're able to kind of showcase what's happening across the company. And legal uniquely has has a view across the entire organization, right? We are the one team that sees everything that's happening. And so we have to, we have to move up from being a reactive organization to adding value, being strategic, and thinking about how can we be a wayfinder for the company. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Um, Ian Schick is going to lead our next presentation uh, entitled Machine Generated Legal Documents 2022. Ian is an internationally recognized intellectual property strategist and leading voice in patent law practice innovation. He is currently uh, a Stanford Codex Fellow and leads the Machine Generated Legal Documents Project. Welcome, Ian. All right, I'm really excited to be here. Thanks, everybody. Um, so, let's see, is this the clicker? Um, right, so I lead the uh, Machine Generated Legal Documents uh, project here. I'm a, a former big law patent attorney and uh, have a background, a technical background in physics. Um, so why, let's see, is there a clicker? There we go. So why, why use computers to generate legal documents? Um, you know, I think the, the, the benefits, uh, at least in, in theory, are, are pretty obvious. Um, for attorneys, uh, better job satisfaction. Um, if, if a computer is being used to generate some or all of, of a legal document, attorneys can spend more time on interesting work instead of um, maybe monotonous uh, legal work. Uh, Machine-generated legal documents uh, allow attorneys to provide more value to their clients. Um, they can spend more time on analysis and, and less time on, um, well, I guess, focus more of their time on, on the vi high value aspects of, of, of what they're doing. Um, it also allows attorneys to provide more value to the law firms that they work for. Uh, each attorney can uh, process more work in less time without sacrificing uh, quality. Uh, on the consumer side, um, using uh, machines to generate documents uh, means the price of documents goes down. Um, by doing that, we improve accessibility. Cheaper documents means more people can access these services. Uh, improve quality, um, believe it or not, uh, automation can act as, as guardrails to reduce human errors. Uh, and finally, faster turnaround. You know, law firms um, using uh, things to accelerate their services, uh, they're, they're uh, better able to keep up uh, on pace with their clients' businesses. So uh, in my view, if we can do it, uh, we should do it. And so kind of the, the big questions that we're trying to answer uh, on, on our project is, you know, how feasible is this really? Um, if you look at high volume, high value legal documents, uh, how, how how feasible is it to, to automate these documents? Um, 
what areas of law do these documents exist? And you know, once we've identified uh, these high value, uh, high volume documents, to what extent can specific documents be automated? Are we talking about 10% or 90%? Uh, and finally, you know, if we are automating uh, the creation of legal documents, where do attorneys fit in? Um, and so to kind of approach these different questions, we developed uh, a framework for thinking about the types of content that exist in legal documents uh, and, and made three buckets, um, bespoke writing, mechanical writing, and canned text. Um, really, uh, all legal documents comp uh, uh, contain some amount of each of these types of, of content. Uh, so I'm gonna go through each one really quickly. Um, what we call bespoke writing uh, this is where attorneys are really providing their primary value add. Um, this represents the uh, intellectual heavy lifting that's involved. Um, it will generally uh, generally involve uh, original analysis on, on unique facts. Um, it's driven by creativity and experience and strategy, super high value. Um, Generally, this is uh, too nuanced, too context dependent, and too consequential for wholesale automation. Uh, mechanical writing is uh, uh, like the rote and mundane parts of creating a document. So think uh, copy, paste, massage, where um, the attorney is grabbing content from another location in the document uh, or a, an external resource pasting it into their document and massaging it into uh, the form that they need that will flow with, with their document. Um, this is the type of work that, at least when I was practicing, I would save till about 7.30 at night because um, you know, there's really not a lot of, of hard thinking that goes on. It's, it's gotta be done right, it's gotta be done completely and correctly, but it just doesn't take uh, much uh, intellectual heavy lifting to complete. Um, turns out, uh, a lot of times, this is, uh, can be a pretty good candidate for uh, auto-generation. Um, finally, canned text. Uh, so this is predetermined text. Um, you know, think boilerplate or stock definitions. Um, you know, really uh, content that's been previously written. There's no fresh writing going on. Um, some people call this static content in that it's, it's shared across uh, multiple documents. Um, this is of course, a good candidate for templatization and, and automated uh, document assembly. So different legal documents have, have different ratios uh, of these different uh, types of content. And depending on uh, which type of content dominates the document, that kind of determines what types of technologies might be useful in automating the document. So let's uh, apply this, uh, this framework to a specific legal document, namely patent applications. Um, here uh, we've got all of the different parts of a patent application uh, categorized based on the type of content. So um, I've, here in Silicon Valley, I think probably a, a lot of folks uh, have at least seen a patent application. Um, in the bespoke writing, clearly the, the patent claims, um, you know, that's the primary value of the document. Uh, that's absolutely bespoke. Uh, and other highly strategic uh, and nuanced parts of the document. Mechanical writing uh, occupies a large portion of, of every patent application, and that's due to uh, statutory requirements of the documents and the conventions that have been developed uh, in response to, to case law. Um, and then finally, uh, of course, there's boilerplate in, in patent applications. Uh, so we've evaluated the, the, the kind of state of the art for content generation. Uh, for patent applications. So bespoke writing, um, you know, and I think these, um, you know, these comments are applicable uh, more, more generally to, to legal documents, but with the bespoke writing, these are human written. Um, they're unique for, for every patent document. Looking at the canned text, uh, this is written once by a human and then manly, manually reused across multiple documents. Uh, when it comes to mechanical writing, we're starting to see um, starting to see some automation out there. Uh, I run a company called Specifio that um, automates mechanical writing in patent applications. Uh, we were the first commercially available solution about five years ago, uh, but now there's at least a dozen companies uh, working in this space, uh, and that includes three major law firms that have developed uh, similar technologies. Um, 
So the way that these systems work, uh, the attorney writes the patent claims and use the, uses that as input to the system. Um, based on the claims, the system will generate uh, everything you see over there uh, by the red parenthesis. Um, this is essentially literal claim support. Um, claim support, basically a recitation of, of language in the claims throughout uh, the patent document. There are parts of mechanical writing that are still manual, um, mainly when it comes to uh, e extracting information. So if there's definitions or, or examples, um, things that are already known, uh, typically an, an attorney will go out to some external resource, grab that, uh, and then paste it in the document and massage. Um, finally, document assembly. Um, right now, the best that we've got can partially uh, automate uh, the, the construction of this content. So, you know, assembling all of this different content into a document, um, but uh, definitely requires a, a bit of human review. Um, so what's, what's next? Uh, when it comes to bespoke writing, we, we want the attorney to be central in that. Um, I think, you know, absent uh, general AI, attorneys are gonna be responsible for this content, um, you know, going forward. Uh, so if we don't want to replace, if we don't want to fully automate this writing, um, how about accelerating it? So there's a couple ways that we might uh, accelerate bespoke writing. One is through predictive text. Um, so for example, uh, suggested uh, sentence completions, the types of things you see on um, like a Gmail uh, message editor. Uh, you know, a couple words appear uh, in front of the cursor. Uh, at guesses of words you might want to type, and you can push enter if you if you want to keep those. Well, we could train that for a legal system and uh, accelerate attorneys' writings writing in that way. Um, another uh, another way to speed up um, attorneys' uh, work on the bespoke writing is through uh, at least what I call dynamic documents. So this is. Um, where you can change one part of a, of a legal document, like say change a uh, term, and then that change will track through the entire document. So currently, um, if, if attorneys are gonna do that, it's a global replace, um, that's not always, that doesn't always do a perfect job. Uh, so it takes a lot of time and it's, uh, it's an opportunity for uh, human error in the process. Uh, looking at mechanical writing, um, you know, at least with patents, this problem has been solved as far as efficacy is, 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 um, is concerned. However, uh, the content is often uh, a little robotic sounding uh, when you read it, uh, a little bit stilted. And so improving the readability of, of this type of content uh, is, is something that, that we're looking at uh, in the patent space. Um, but more generally across legal, it's really a matter of identifying documents that can be automated. Um, so kind of the first big document being automated was contracts. It's dominated by ca canned text, um, so it's largely a kind of uh, categorization, selection, and assembly job. There's not a lot of actual language generation that's going on. Um, this kind of second generation that um, you know, my company is a part of, um, patent applications where we're actually generating content um, there's uh, a lot of activity with um, uh, litigation documents as well. Um, Briefpoint and uh, uh, Legalmation are a couple companies that uh, are working in this space, really doing exactly what Specifio does. Take in a little bit of attorney written work product and then spit out a bunch of content. Um, in, in the case of litigation documents, it's, it's responses. Uh, looking at can text, um, there's, there's a ton of, of opportunity here. Um, it's really, I mean, there's a ton of can text out there. How do we get it? How do we take advantage of it? Um, one kind of cool thing that we made at Specifio was a, a tool that uh, you could put in uh, the name of a law firm, the name of a company uh, that, that is a patent owner, and then our system would look at all of the uh, published patent applications and patents, uh, cluster them, um, you know, based on uh, law firm and um, uh, uh, owner of the document, assignee or, or client, and uh, further cluster them based on shared language and actually extract out the templates, the underlying templates that were used by the law firm to create all of the work product for 
um, for the uh, for the company. Um, so it, it, that's just one example, but um, you know the point is uh, the data is out there. We just got to figure out how to get it. So I can see um, scenarios where uh, boilerplate would be automatically suggested or. Um, Automatically chosen uh, while you're typing, you know, consider put this in. Um, another area where can text uh, utilization can be improved is um, through language synchronization. So if we're uh, taking content from a variety of sources, packing it into one single document, um, that document needs to be self consistent. The language needs to be self consistent throughout the document. So uh, maybe something like identify all the synonyms and make them one word, um, something like that. Uh, so, to wrap this up, um, you know, my expectations, our expectations with the group is that, uh, like I mentioned earlier, absent general AI, uh, AI uh, automation is, is not going to replace uh, attorneys. Uh, however, you know, that's often the knee-jerk reaction that, that we hear. Um, the highest value writing is going to stay with attorneys, and the rote and mundane parts of legal writing is being automated away as we speak. and. Uh, I don't think it'll be missed very much. Um, it's my last slide. I'd love to take any questions. Thank you. And we're running a little behind, so maybe one question. We'll take one question. Sure. Thank you. So my question is, as more portion, or excuse me, as a higher portion of attorneys' work becomes automated, what kind of changes do you think are going to happen in the industry, just as far as the lawyer's relationship with the client and maybe the justice system as a whole? Yeah, well, I think there's some parallels in other uh, professional service industries um, that we can look to uh, as, as maybe foreshadowing what will happen with us. Um, accountants, for example, the, the uh, electronic spreadsheet was released in uh, 1979. Within a couple years, there was global adoption of it. No longer did accountants have you know, big paper ledgers. They weren't adding up giant columns of numbers. Uh, so that was a big chunk, chunk of their job that was automated away. And you know, in 1982, we didn't lose half of the accountants. Instead, what happened was the cost of their services went down. Um, and so, you know, more people were uh, accessing the services of accountants, and the job itself was better. You know, you didn't have to do that that arithmetic anymore, uh, that kind of boring, tedious work. Uh, it was just done for you, and so it attracted more people to the field. Um, so I, I think, you know, in, in general, across the field, for the professionals and for the consumers, automating a big chunk of the boring work that accountants do. Uh, was, was a major positive. Um, we saw a similar effect with uh, computer-aided drafting in the mid-90s with architects. Um, so I, I expect uh, a similar effect uh, with, with automating uh, documents 